Yeah, um, get the light there. All right, so your therapist literally doesn't have a couch? No, no, wait. She has a couch on the other side of the room that I've never seen anybody use, kind of oh. like the couch that was at my grandma's house when I was young. Wow. But, but yeah, no, we have we just have two chairs. And I would, uh, I would have sworn in like our, our the therapist ethical code. There's something about that clients have to sit on a couch. No, so no. that's impressive. Do you have a lot of plants in there at all? Um, wow, I used to have plants at my old office. I do not have plants. Does your therapist have plants? I, yeah, I think that you're uh, you're breaking some kind of law there. Okay, but I do have a mini um, Zen garden that people can rake, and I also those have are so, yeah, those are so I lame. I know that's they're like, not as fun as I thought they would be. They're really no. not. Well, that's like my ther my therapist. My, my big bugaboo with my therapist is she has all of these inspirational uh, oh, little tchotchkes you buy at the Christmas tree shop yeah. on her wall. And it's like, to me, it's the kind of thing where believe, inspire, you're the best. And to me, a therapist's office is the worst place for those. Because that's just, people are like struggling with those well, things. Well, that's just like rubbing salt in people's wounds. I don't know if anybody's finding them, you know, inspiring, but it's, yeah. Well, that's a very good point. I have a couple of games on my wall um, that are fun to play with. I've got a refrigerator. Uh Okay, I, I have no inspiration. So, so a, re a refrigerator and no plants. You essentially have a dorm room. Oh, th okay. That's very that's very funny. Yes, I do. And I actually have a snack closet as well. I say it for <laughs> but uh, they're usually snacks that I enjoy. My uh, my guest today is uh, Joshua Shea. Josh, how you doing? I'm doing quite well. How are you? Good. Well, we're here to promote our book. And that's a phrase that I, 15 years ago, always wanted to say and uh, got to the point where I wasn't sure if I would ever get to say it. Um, and before we even get to that, this is your second book that you've written. Yes. And I did really like one of the posts that I saw you write was, uh, and, and maybe you can recall this one by memory, but it was talking about, was it when you got out of, um, was it rehab or was it, uh, when you, when you were in prison that, I mean, to go from there to, Hey, here's my first book. I mean, what was that experience like? Uh, well, it was crazy. I mean, I never set out to do any of this. I really just, uh, first, I just wanted to do whatever I needed to do to make the judge happy okay. and get as little uh, time as possible. Then when I actually went into inpatient rehab, I realized, holy my God, I'm, I'm a mess. I clearly need to fix myself here. There yeah. is a couple decades of, of issues here. Um, and as I started fixing myself, uh, I started becoming a kind of a new person. And okay. then when I, when I served my six months in jail, that was when I started meeting guys who had all kinds of sex addiction issues and porn addiction issues. And they were more embarrassed by those than they were their drug abuse issues wow. or their domestic abuse issues. It, it, was, it was those things that really uh, freaked him out. So I thought to myself, I remembered back two years earlier when uh, I first uh, got arrested, when I first faced the idea that I was an addict, and I went to the uh, Barnes & Noble which was the closest bookstore, like 20 miles from my house is now where the closest bookstore was. We had yeah. four bookstores in town when I was growing up. And uh, as far as the addiction section went, there were a few basic books about addiction. There was one book about sex addiction, but it was incredibly technical and didn't really say anything about porn or internet porn because I think it had been written 10 years earlier. Yeah. Um, so I just, I just, you know, I, I remember that uh, there was no resources for somebody like me unless I wanted to read studies, which I do enjoy reading, but I know the average person doesn't. Nice. So I, I uh, in, in, when I was in jail, about two months in, I decided I'd write my first book. I thought that would be it. I got out, put it on a shelf for my first few, few uh, months out of jail, then finally went back to it and uh, edited it down and got it off to a publisher finally. It, you, and I had a, you and I had a very easy time finding a publisher this well, time. And I want to get to that too, because I mean, that is something that I have always heard of how difficult it is. And you even let me know that this is going to be incredibly difficult and most likely we'll have to self-publish. And then it was, you know, I think you sent out a dozen or so like what packets or kits and we got back multiple offers so it was like yeah well, and it was and it was and it was literally in the first week when I did my book the first time I kid you not I sent out probably a hundred hundred and twenty queries and I got some wonderful responses from people who were like 
this is an important book. This is a very needed book. And I'm not touching it with a 10 foot pole yeah, because was, I'm not going to be the first guy to step up and do this. And yeah. they, they would, they would say, you know, you're going to be a maverick in this field. You're going to make it easy for people who come after you, but it's going to be hard to get your first book out there. And it, it really was. Well, when I, I remember when I was in the software industry, there was a, there was a guy who had done very well, but he wasn't necessarily an innovator. And he loved having, uh, saying the phrase, the pioneers get the arrows and the settlers get the land. I've always remembered that. So in essence, you were kind of getting that same thing, right? We're not willing to take the arrows. We'll come after and take the land. Right. Right. Ex exactly. So uh, I wrote this book. Uh, I felt the need to get it out there. When it the got out. When the book was called? The Addiction? The book was called The Addiction Nobody Will Talk About. I actually, I actually have an updated version of it um this is from the uh um two months ago hold hold on just one second i literally just hit a button uh oh are you still recording uh, yeah no i hit a button and and i hear something else going on in the background that's funny so hold on let me just the voices turn everything your head josh do we did you need to come lay down for a minute we can talk about this what are those voices telling you is it a, a youtube video I, I yeah I I can't I can't tell where it's I can't tell where it's coming from. <laughs> um, this is really embarrassing. This is the first time this has ever happened. That is okay. That's strange. Where the first time we, while you're Hold trying on. to find that, the yeah the first time we did our interview. Um, oh I, okay I found it. It's uh, I I I think I hit the no. <laughs> oh you've got to be kidding. This is embarrassing. So I will. I will probably edit most of this. Can out. we just? Can we just like go back and start over? What? What is this? I I literally hear a podcast I recorded like two days ago in my headphones. Oh, that's a trip. I oh, I'll, that's... I'll edit all this out. You gotta find it though, right? Yeah, yeah. I. Okay, let me look. <laughs> I'm literally shutting every window I have, and it's still. The Phantom Podcast. Do you need to like? Do you need to quit everything and then jump back on the line? No, I don't want to. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll hit stop recording for a second. I'll do that. Okay. Oh, pause. I'll hit pause. Okay. And we're back. So, uh, so that was kind of a fun experience, right? Sorry. No, you're good. I, I, no, I, it's, it's, there was another podcast I recorded a few days ago playing in my head and they <laughs> are in my headphones, I should say. So I, I don't have quite the craziness. Right. Um, and it just, you know, I, I, I'm so enthralling. I started listening to it. Okay. And then it was hard of, and I had some very funny lines there, but you were so intent on finding where <laughs> that came from. I started talking about the voices in your head. I, I asked you, yeah. how, how do you feel about that? Where does that come from? And I was, well, I, 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 I started panicking. I could tell there, that fight or flight was going on. Yeah. It was all yeah. that we were shooting up, which we talk about in our book, but we'll get to that later. Now, where we left off was the name of your first book. Okay. There we go. There it is. This is, this is called The Addiction Nobody Will Talk About. I actually re-released it in September of uh, this year um, It with a new chapter that kind of updates where I've been and what happened to me. Um, and the strange, I came on your, your show was actually the first one that I came on oh, wow. uh, or that, 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 that appeared. I recorded two or three, mm -hmm. um, but yours was the first that got posted. And from that day forward, I started getting email and my website immediately uh, started to take off. And what surprised me from basically day one was that uh, I was getting just as many, um, uh, emails and messages from the wives and girlfriends of addicts who wanted help. And I found that the uh, people who were following my website, it was actually more uh, wives and girlfriends of porn and sex addicts wow. who were go who had the trauma, uh, betrayal trauma, betrayal trauma, who were going through uh, the therapy sessions and just wanted to talk to a guy who had kind of made it to the other side or was doing okay. at least better than their guys were. And it didn't take me long. And and obviously the first book comes out, so I'm thinking, what am I going to do next? And it didn't take long, maybe three, four months before I was like, okay, clearly I created a resource for the addicts themselves by telling my story in my first book. Mm -hmm. um, 
I think that these women need some kind of resource that's more than just another woman telling their story, because that's all that was out there was, here's my story of betrayal trauma. There was nothing really from the uh, porn addict's point of view, and there was nothing from a real therapist's point of view. And I had a conversation with my therapist, and we were talking about how I was sometimes hesitant when I'd go on a podcast. Or I was giving, or I was giving advice uh, through email that I didn't want to get too technical or too medical or become their de facto therapist because I didn't want to say something wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to give them advice that was going to send their life in the wrong direction. Uh, and she made the mention that, well, I at least have the experience. She sometimes hears from people, well, you don't know how I'm really feeling because you've never been there. Yeah. And, and I'm sure you must have got that more than oh, once cool. as a therapist. Yes. And, uh, and it just, you know, one of those little light bulb moments where the universe gives you the idea was, wouldn't this be interesting if we got both sides of this uh, interesting equation into one book because I know for sure that's never been done. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to toot your horn, when I was thinking of who do I want to team with, you were the number one person on the list. Yeah. Um, if you, if you would have if you would have said no, I would have figured out somebody else, yeah. but I didn't have a fallback. I, you were the first one that I wanted. Man, I, I uh, imposter syndrome kicks in. I'm grateful because, uh, but, and we'll get well, to the you, like, you got me fooled. Because <laughs> how difficult that was. And, and I want to, I do want to get to that. I want to first though, um, the fact that you did write your first book was incredible because I know there is so much shame around it. Um, and when you, I like how you were saying when you were in jail, people didn't want to talk about it at all. I mean, I feel like there is that, that talk about vulnerability of going out there and saying, hey, here's all of my dirty laundry. And I know that in working with addicts, that's a huge part of their recovery, but that doesn't mean that they want to go announce it or talk about it or podcast about it or have it out there in the Library of Congress. So, I mean, right. what do you remember if the, a, a time where then all of a sudden that made sense or you felt like I, I can do this or I can be that open? Through during the two years that I was uh, going through recovery between my initial arrest uh, and my sentencing, uh, any time that I made a court appearance or any time that a motion was filed, because of my stature in my local uh, community, it made news. Mm -hmm. And you know, I never went to court without a TV camera there. I never went to court without a newspaper guy there. And because I used to work in the media as a journalist, I get it. I I, I used to be that guy on the other side of the jury box who yeah. was doing the reporting. When somebody has a certain level of visibility, it's a news story. And I certainly was there. Nonetheless, I still felt a little bit resentful that, you know, Joe the plumber or Bob the, the tow truck driver, uh, they weren't on the front page of the newspaper every time something happened. Yeah. And that made me feel resentful for a while, but then I started to realize as I was thinking about doing a book, as I was starting to evolve with my recovery and dropping things like resentments, that because my story is out there, I can't hide from it. Yeah. Most of these guys who are unknown can hide from their story. You know, n not only is my story out there, there's a whole heck of a lot of wrong information about my story out there. Mm -hmm. And, um, if I wanted to not necessarily set the record straight, because I know there were some people who will never believe me no matter what yeah, I say, sure. uh, but just to tell my side of the story or, or my recollection of events and, and my opinions, um, and to get this idea out there that, you know, there is no stereotypical porn addict. Yeah. If you are a porn addict, seek help. Um, I, I could be the one who could write this because, um, uh, I had the kind of stature that I thought a publisher might be interested in. I know it was only localized to Maine, uh, but because I had a bit of a local stature, I knew that I could get podcast interviews. I know that I'm a half decent communicator, so I, I could tell my story. Um, you okay. happen to be a writer as well, which is, uh, didn't, didn't hurt. Right? Yeah, no, that, and that didn't, that didn't hurt either. So I knew that I brought some things to the table that the average uh, porn addict or sex addict or somebody going through my situation may not have. So yeah. having these skills and, and wanting to 
give something back uh, at that point, I really, um, I really just came to the conclusion that writing this book uh, would, you know, not necessarily atone for my sins because I don't think on some level there is atoning for that specific sin. I thought that maybe I could uh, post that uh, horrible mistake make some good choices that karmically uh, would try to even the score. Sure. And okay. And I, and I like um, if anybody wants to hear your story as well, cause I'm sure that there are going to be people that didn't hear our interview. Cause that was, a, that was a long time ago. Almost two um, years now. Yeah. Right. So, so I would love to, I'll put links for that in the show notes because um, you're, you know, you did go into all the, the, the arrest and actually what you, we're going through at the time the TV cameras, the expectations in the area, the people, the, the haters, so to speak. I mean, yeah. so uh, you know, def- definitely go listen to our first interview. Um, a couple of things on your bio too that I wanted to point out is I like how you, you said how I got here. Welcome to my attempt to turn what were the worst parts of my life into something that can hopefully help others. And, well, and that's I, my like, old bio. It is. I just pulled it off this morning though, Josh. Come on now, let's uh, let's update this thing, right? But no, but I do. I enjoy that because. I feel like a lot of times that's, you know, people do feel like that's almost a cliche, so to speak. Um, yeah. uh, right. When you're in the depths of um, worst moments of your life, rock bottom right. sort of thing. I mean, I feel like that's one of those things that you would hear on your, or see on your therapist wall. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and where at that moment, I mean, so did you have those moments where it was, that wasn't a thought at all. It, like you say, it was just get through this. I mean, Oh, abs- oh absolutely. Absolutely. And, 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 you know, I even understand how, slightly trite it sounds you know Uh i i you know i didn't experience this when i was in jail um but you hear about people who go to prison for long stretches and find jesus and it's like if if only you could have found jesus six months earlier um maybe you wouldn't have done that stupid thing um and, and you know i i do understand that it's trite and i also don't I don't hide the fact that now, two years later, I'm trying to build something off of this. Mm-hmm. I want to be an advocate. I want to be a go-to resource for people. Um, I feel like, especially now that I connect with a lot of the partners, um, yeah. I feel like this is in some way a calling. I feel like this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Uh, I would love to get to a point where you know I could make some money off of it. Sure. Um, you know, you and I are not going to get rich off this book. Maybe. No. There are speaking opportunities or other things that, you know, will come down the line. Uh, But this is what I feel like more than running a magazine, more than being a city councilor. This is what it feels like I I, I was kind of put here for. And as I get further away from that old life, uh, there just is something, uh, I don't want to say pure, but there is something worthwhile there's something that i feel like uh there's fulfillment okay where yeah, yeah. where before the addiction yeah. was trying okay. to yeah. fulfill me or or all my professional endeavors were trying to fulfill me and now just doing this simple thing where it's uh, updating my website daily or doing these podcasts or working on the books whatever it is you know i try to spend a couple hours a day on that and that you know not only is it a wonderful recovery exercise it really leaves me feeling fulfilled uh, in a way that I haven't felt over such a period of time in I any like, time in my life. Well, I always say, because I always say when somebody turns away from the addiction, it's not just this, uh, they get the negative out of their life, but the, the growth of the, the, it's so much exponentially uh, more empowering and uh, fulfilling, whether you're pouring that time into parenting, your relationship, your career, your faith, your health, Uh, Because I feel like those are all those voids. When people create those voids, that's when they do turn to that quick fix, the the impulse, the addiction. So, um, so that I think what you just said, I it it backs up what I try to preach to clients on a daily basis. Of um, because a lot of times I feel like they say, yeah, but then I won't have this immediate dopamine rush that I'm used to. And it's hard to sell somebody on uh, two hours of writing or speaking or helping someone. It really is more fulfilling. But I mean, not trying to be crude, it just doesn't. But it doesn't have that that quick dopamine rush of an orgasm or something. You right. Know? Right. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And, and I have to, I I'll, you know, on your show for the first time, I'll admit, you know, I probably am drinking too much coffee and having a little too much caffeine yeah. and, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to be working on that in the new year. Um, yeah. So, you know, I, I'm, 
you know, by no means a saint. And the other thing that I discovered in uh, recovery was I just thought everything about me was a bad person you okay. know, at, at the beginning. And as you get into recovery, you start to realize that there was there was a lot about you that was good anyway. Um, there was a lot about your personality that people did like. Um, and there were a lot of things that, you know, as benign as they seem, you're going to still be the same person afterwards. I mean, I love Count Chocula cereal. Uh, I liked it before I, I got into recovery. I like it still now. Not everything about you changes. And I think a lot of people fear recovery because they see basically a complete wiping of the uh -huh. slate and this whole new person sprouting up that they don't know. And that's not what happens. And they're you afraid, are, they're afraid are, it will be the person that they, right, right. right. You, you are this, if you can do the hard work, you are the same person. You're just a better version of that person. I like that. And by the way, I'm a, I'm a booberry man. The Count Chocula. The My Chocula. son is too. My son is too. And you know, I don't, That's I don't understand you, you weird folks. <laughs> so, uh, all right. One more thing then from the old bio. And then I think let's get into the book. Uh, you said, I believe if we can begin to talk more about porn addiction and mental health, others may be able to address their addictions before they devolve to the unhealthy and criminal places where mine hit rock bottom. And I feel like as, you know, the, even my path back recovery program, or, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I have people say, hey, I'm not an addict, so I really, I, I don't need to do anything about it. And we cover that a lot in the book, that whole concept about is, is it even addiction? And, and I love that you, had, you did an article in Recovery Today magazine where you had asked me to, to comment on it. And I think we both came from a bit of a, the same place. If somebody, th there is no diagnosis, official diagnosis for pornography addiction, right? There's impulse control disorder. Um, there's compulsive sexual behaviors. So I feel like this is the thing where, man, if some people feel like they have to be, be able to label it as an addiction before they need to deal with it. And I think that what our book really gets into is if it's something that's getting in the way of your marriage, something that you've tried to turn away from in the past that you have been unsuccessful at, it's, you can do something about it right now. You don't have to get caught. You don't have to, um, right. you don't have to hit rock bottom. I mean, I don't know. Can you kind of speak to that? Were there times going on in the addiction where you were I, I need to put this behind me or was it the classic? Oh yeah. I did it, I did it every, every well, time was the last time. Well, uh, with pornography, I have to be honest in that I knew that I used it differently than other people, mm -hmm. but I almost always used it in tandem with alcohol. I okay. knew that I was an alcoholic. And when I first went off to rehab, you know, shortly after I was arrested, I still thought that it was just kind of a subsection oh. of, my, of my alcoholism. It wasn't until I started meeting with a CSAT uh, yeah. off, cam off campus at my first rehab that, you know, I, I came to understand this is a separate co-occurring disorder. Yeah. And this has actually been around even longer than my drinking right. uh, but by several years. Uh, and this is something that needs to be addressed as a whole uh, unto itself. Did I make promises to myself? Yeah, especially towards the end when I would you know, be up till three, four in the morning in these chat rooms, you know, I'd say, I've got to go to bed. I need to get more than two hours of sleep. I can't get two hours of sleep three, four days in a row. I'm going to be a mess. And tonight I'm going to go to bed at 11 o'clock when I'm done doing my work. And there I find myself three 30 in the morning, not being satisfied by what I'm finding online. Yeah. And just like, how did I get here again? Yeah. How did I get here again? And it's the same feeling that I had, you know, every Every time I got behind the wheel of a car after I drank too much and I'd just be sitting there going, I can't believe I did this again. And I could either face the shame of calling home and saying that I drank too much yet again and having to put her out and deal with coming to get the car in the morning. And that's a pain yeah. or I can just risk it, turn the key and I know the way home. Right. And too many times I did that. And it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where you do make bargains with yourself and you do make promises to yourself. And when you can't keep basic promises to yourself, like how are you going to keep them to anybody else? Okay. I like that. Cause I, that I, I like the way you frame that because it is always, this is the last time I will not do this again. I will not stay up till three again, binging on porn. I will not. Right. I mean, after this time, never again. Yeah. And that is that. And then you're breaking that promise to yourself uh, over and over. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Let's talk about the book. And then we, we both picked out a couple of uh, chapters and some questions that we want to read. Yeah. Um, where did I all right. put that Here's mark? the part where uh, I, uh, my, me being vulnerable, uh, I was a, I okay. was not a good co-author, Josh. 
Um, and you were, you were so kind to me. I look, this is, that there, go watch the video. <laughs> Josh, in the acting role of his lifetime is acting surprise. No, no, don't okay. say that. All right. <laughs> so, I mean, I, and I want to talk about like what that process was like for you, uh, the struggles I had because they were very. Why strange. won't he write the damn book? Goodness, right? Why won't he write the damn book? But I had so, you know, okay. Uh, I will not. Now will be my therapy session. Let me go sit on the couch uh, for those not okay. watching on the video. Um, I, I, there were so many things that I, I, the imposter syndrome is real. I think there was a part of me that felt like, yeah. man, who am I to then throw this advice out? And I think it's part of what you were talking about earlier when the partners reached out to you yeah. and you were afraid to say the wrong thing. And I was, I mean, I was confident. I, I mean, I, I literally at the time where we started working together, I had, I had, I, I remember I had helped over a thousand people with this and I'd done years of betrayal trauma training. And so I felt like very confident, but then there's something just about putting that on a page. I mean, did you feel that way in your first book, in this book, that it's, it's there, you know? I, uh, yeah, I, I look back to my first book. Mm -hmm. I look back to some of those interviews I did, and I, I have moved a bit away from telling my story over and over and over. I mean, I still mm -hmm. have to do it at the beginning of podcasts, but yeah. we don't get into the deep, deep details anymore. And I look at some of those old podcasts, or when I added that chapter to my book, uh, back last fall, I, I reread the book for the first time in a year. And it struck me just how honest I was mm -hmm. and just how vulnerable I was. I mean, I was slightly impressed with myself that, oh, my, wow, I was really, I mean, I shared some stuff that I, at this point, don't bring up unless people ask. Yeah. Um, and, and that was... Uh, that was illuminating because now I try to play more of an expert role or try to, you know, talk about uh, the recovery of it rather than the addiction of it. Yeah. Uh, so that, yeah, that was, that was, uh, there's definitely imposter syndrome when I'm doing anything except writing. Because okay. when, when I was in sixth or seventh grade, people started telling me I was a good writer. And this was just uh, creative writing stories. The only thing that my family, my teachers, my friends, the only thing it seemed like everybody could get together on the same page about was that I was a good writer. Okay. And then I got the job at the local newspaper when I was 17 years old. That to me was validation I was a good writer because I was hanging around with adults who were also writing and I was at their level. So the only thing I have ever felt 100% uh, convinced that I can do with any level of skill is to write. So and it's, it's, funny it's one of those things where it's, it, it, I have to pull back yeah. when people tell me they can't write or my wife says, you know, can you help me with this? Yeah. Uh, or my mom or dad even still come to me and ask me to help them. And it's like, it's just writing down the, the voices in your head. That's, yeah. that's all writing is. It's just, and, and I have to recognize that not everybody has honed that skill for, you know, you say you need 10,000 hours to be a master at something. And I'm sure I've put that in by now. Um, that's the only time I feel like I know what I'm doing. Husband, well, that, father, well, anything else, total yeah. imposter. Well, that makes sense of the, when you would get so frustrated, because to me, I had written a humor column for a decade. I mean, I used to write for, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, running websites. I used to, and so I, I felt like, okay, I could write humor columns all day long. I could write about running. I used to write uh, about computers, you know, but it was like, man, this stuff is affecting people's lives. I want to make sure I get it exactly right. And I think that was part of the struggle. Um, I liked it. Then you were so uh, patient. And then you came up with the idea of what we would meet once or twice a week, 5 a.m. Uh, my time, 8 a.m. your time. Uh, you would ask the question and I would ramble on. And uh, then you would take the answers and then transcribe. And I think that was kind of where then I think thing, that was step one of where I felt like, okay, we can do this. Um, that was a stroke of genius, Josh. That was a uh, well. That, I, that that's actually the technique I use when I ghostwrite. Okay. Uh, I you know I like I said I don't make a living at all off of this porn addiction stuff. I I lose money on it. Uh -huh. um, my day job is as a ghostwriter, and I usually talk with CEOs or other high ranking people in uh, businesses, or I talk to people who finally want to get their life story down on paper. Maybe they're an older person. And sometimes people have 20, 30 pages written, or they have some outlines, but it's often never enough, and I need a lot to fill in. So I'll do these kinds of interviews where I ask questions and they answer them because I can 
then you know transcribe their answers, clean them up, put them into readable uh, readable way, and do it. So it was uh, it was nothing that I'd never done before, mm -hmm. and you know I realized that uh, with your arthritis, you weren't going to be typing your answers, so I had to get them out of you somehow. The funny thing is, like, yeah, anyone listening to that, wait, Tony has arthritis. It's no, you have no idea how much I type. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm overly verbose, and which ended up being a problem when I once, once I did get uh, going with the typing. So that is, that is funny. I think that was part of my own frustration. Is I actually enjoy writing as well, and you know, and I, if anything, uh, I, I, when I started writing um, in a newspaper, I struggled with word count. I mean, I had a hard yeah. time ever paring things down, which I think we ran into as well. Oh, I, I and I still do. My first book. Uh, my first draft was 200,000 words and I had to cut it down to 90,000. Oh, wow. Okay. That's hard. I still haven't posted yeah. about the book on my uh, Instagram uh, story because I learned that they have a 2,200 character limit and I really am, huh. I've got it down to about 2,400 characters. I mean, I'm really struggling because it, there's so much I want to say. But, but the editor side in me also has said, nobody wants to read that much. Absolutely. And I am aware of that, right? Get, I'm aware get, of get, every, get everything you need into the first three paragraphs, yeah. including the link where they can go get the book and then ramble on and they can skip that if they want, or they can read it if yeah. they want. Yeah. Um, but you got to get everything into the first three paragraphs. But, so I, I, I think the part that was the most difficult for me was once I really started looking at the answers and I really did, I, I believed in the book the entire time. I was excited about it. I think a couple of things I thought were really, uh, that I really enjoyed. One was that we decided that, I mean, you had to hear my answers, but you wrote your answers first. So your answers weren't going to be influenced by mine at all. And mine were not going to be influenced by yours at all. And I think that when I got the book, um, and I will hold it up now for the YouTube uh, crowd, Josh as well, right? When I, when I got the book, I was, I was surprised at, uh, I, I was just very, very, I don't want to sound goofy, but very proud of the work that we did because we do, we, we disagree in some sections. We kind of validate each other in some sections um, and disagree is maybe even a strong word, but just coming at it from those two different angles, I think is so helpful. I think for the person, the betrayed uh, to really, like you said, and I liked it, that I didn't realize you were getting so much um, feedback from the betrayed to really get to interview an addict, so to speak, because yeah. even when they are asking their partners, what, what's this like for you? it's it's expected that they're not going to believe them because i mean right. they, they've, they've had their their world kind of turned upside down and now they're saying hey tell me about that you know and it's like well i, I don't believe that or i can't believe you're saying that or so that part i think is is amazing the answers to your questions and we're going to get to some of those what i struggled with a lot was and i shared this with you i think over and over i just didn't want the betrayed to feel like it was their fault i i struggled so hard of wanting to convey that as well as and I, I know that I went over this a million times with you, but every, you know, every situation truly is different. And so I feel like when people are saying, here's what you need to do, the person that is going through this, I mean, they got every bit of their own experiences that led up to that moment. So they, they're going to feel like, yeah, but you don't understand where I'm coming from, you know, to whoever is giving them advice. And I think that got in the way of any, more than anything for me. Yeah. But I mean, you've, as as somebody who has sat with these thousands of people and as somebody who has a podcast that you can see there are hundreds, thousands of people listening, uh, you, you must, and I, I understand imposter syndrome, but you must understand on a logical level that people are getting something out of this or they oh, wouldn't be absolutely. coming back. Yeah, and, and, the, no, and this was a situation where that, the, you know, I was able to set that imposter syndrome aside. I think the part that I was working with was I mean, I truly feel at, at my, in my bones that, you know, true empathy is what is required for somebody has to feel heard and understood before they can move on to recovery. And, and that's why I feel like, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've spoken for 20 something years as a motivational speaker to schools and that sort of thing. And, and I now realize that motivational speaker, I feel like when I do that, I go whip somebody into a frenzy, they can do it. But then when yeah. they go home and then they don't do it, then that, that has even a negative effect where then they're like, man, I felt so good. I was committed to whatever it was that I just heard. And now that I'm not doing it, something must be wrong with me. So I feel, you know, I think I was feeling that. Yeah, but that has, enough, that has nothing to do with you. But you're missing the point though here. So the point though is like, I'm, I'm about to, I'm, you know, here I am, I'm going to be the person that says, here's what you need to do. Person reads it. And then when they, they're like, yeah. And then when they go home and they're like, I can't do that. Then they're like, okay, I'm a mess. So I was trying to convey, you know, with my answers even of, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share with you my professional opinion. But I felt like in every answer, I was trying to like package that, wrap that, 
in this bubble wrap of not just your mileage may vary, but I recognize that you have so many more experiences that nobody will ever understand that lead to this moment that I'm going to give you some advice. And then here's also a framework that if this doesn't work for you, that doesn't mean anything's wrong with you. It doesn't mean it was your fault. And it means that, you know, we're going to find an answer somehow, if that makes sense. Yeah. Do you think that that was uh, truly about worrying about their individual point of view? Or do you feel like uh, it was about you failing them and oh, you, wanted to, you wanted to put a big buffer on each side of your answer? Mm -hmm. So it's almost like being in a bounce house yeah, where yeah. you're never going to land too hard no, because I question. put this that's, around. That's a great question. But I feel like this is at the core of my very being as a therapist. I mean, I have made a decision over the last few years and I feel like this is what's helped me connect with, with addicts in particular, where, you know, and, I, and I've gone on a few podcasts and talked about this, where I feel like at the core of an addict even is this, um, hey, I, I can't, I've tried to stop and it doesn't work. So I'm broken. So I can go ahead and go back to my addiction. And even they'll go, you know, they'll, they'll do an online program or they'll read a book and then they go back to their addiction. So they're like, something must be wrong with me. And I've made the decision a long time ago that, you know, I'm, I'm the therapist that's going to say, okay, you didn't do the homework. That, okay, well, well all right, then now there's where we're working from. So now we've got that data to work with. And, you know, and I almost feel like people are coming in and they want to say at some point, can you go ahead and just, I'm trying to do, you know, I'm going through the motions, but uh, can you go ahead and just tell me I'm broken and because I'm not willing to validate it. Yeah, validate that so that I can go back and do the addiction, you know, because the brain really is wired for path of least resistance. You know, it, it's afraid well, of that, you know, what, what could happen if I do this? Like you said earlier, what is that change going to actually look like? Well, and I, 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 well, and I also know that, you know, I felt this way and I've known, I mean, I know addicts, you know, drugs, uh, alcohol, you, you name it, I've met them. I think there's this common thread of I'm still alive. This hasn't killed me. Yeah. And if this hasn't killed me, it's not the worst thing in the world. So I really so need to, to go. I can, I can get by. Yep. No, that's exactly it. And so, and I'll, I'll kind of go a sidestep and then I want to get to, man, time's flying by here. But so I, I do a, a tremendous amount of work in helping people that are in relationships with uh, narcissists, people with personality disorders. And I feel like in anybody is in, this will make sense, I, I promise. But I feel like anybody who just Googles when they kind of all of a sudden recognize, oh my gosh, I'm, at, you know, I've been gaslit my entire life or, you know, per, this person never takes ownership for their actions or, you know, all of these things, these kind of components of, let's just say, narcissistic personality disorder. Um, if you they, then they go Google it, everything says, get out now, run away, you know, but the person I know sees that and they're like, yeah, but mine's a little bit different because he is nice sometimes or, you right. know, but, but we do have kids or we've got uh, our retirement together or, we, you know, and it's like, so I feel like I made this decision long ago that, you know, I know people are going to, in essence, do what they're going to do. I mean, they, they really are. And so they need somebody there on that journey. And if they have to rule out that, uh, no, I think I can make this work. Or I actually do think I have some tools now that will help me, you know, change his mind. I know <laughs> with personality disorders, that's not going to happen. I mean, I, I don't mean yeah. to sound so black or white, but it's like somebody has to be there with them to kind of say, all right, hey, I know you went back in and, and you did another round of trying to rule things out. So now let's process that. And, and I'm not the person that's going to say, see, told you. So I feel like that at my core is kind of what got in the way here. But, and that's why I appreciated your patience. Because then once we got the answers down, I started writing. Then I started going on and on and on, you know, wanting to every, every question and answer, I wanted to throw acceptance and commitment therapy in there and, you know, all that stuff. Well, and the, the truth is that any one of our questions could be a chapter unto itself. Oh, yeah. And there, there are some of our questions, there's a lot of our chapters that are, could be books unto themselves. And, yeah. you know, my, my vision for this was just, you know, the average woman, not somebody who is a, you know, psychotherapist or, yeah. you know, a Rhodes Scholar with seven master's degrees, um, not somebody who is a complete moron either. You're yeah. just your average person. Could they pick this up? Somebody who is is going through this traumatic thing, could they pick this up and in easy enough terms just move a little forward? You know, you and I, if you if you and I had a dollar for every time we said in the book, go get some real help. Oh uh, man, yeah. You know, we wouldn't have to sell these books; we'd be rich. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's the way that I kind of look at it. Is that, and that's the way that I kind of now look at my role when I talk to people. Is I am that way station between doing nothing and sitting down with you. 
Yeah. I'm the guy who can say, here's what, here's what's going to happen when you get there. Here's what you have to expect. Um, you know, I, I, I see, see myself as kind of the person who eases them into the situation because I've been there. Yeah. Okay. Let's grab our books. Um, we picked three, three questions and I would love okay. to, um, here we go. I, I feel like this is a very, what page do you want to go uh, to first? Let's, let's go with, uh, let's start with 150. Okay. Okay. So 150, the question is finding out he's addicted to porn has turned me off to sex completely. What should I do? And, uh, and I just, I really appreciated your answer here. Um, so I'm going to try to read, this mine's a little long. I'm going to try to go through it quickly. So Tony, the mental health professional, this probably goes right to the core concern that most women in this situation have, which is to wonder what they did to cause the addiction. Uh, as I mentioned elsewhere in uh, the answer is nothing, but that doesn't mean that there aren't going to be repercussions to not only your sex life, but also your sexual desire. It's perfectly normal for your libido to take a hit after disclosure or discovery of porn addiction. It's easy to believe that he lacks satisfaction in your physical appearance or in your sex life, and this is why he's turned to pornography, and that can cause emotional trauma involving intimacy. Uh, this is where I try to offer hope that, yes, while your intimate feelings have taken a hit, this is an opportunity to start the recovery process if you're both willing to do the work. This is where you're going to start to build an entirely different relationship around intimacy. Like so many other aspects, time is your friend. If you can be patient, it'll take time to talk through your emotions with your partner and with a professional. There you go, Josh. The more you can express your thoughts, the more you'll be able to heal. Um, and, and then I really, I feel like I, I'm wanting to talk about, it. I'll just continue to read. There's fascinating data on the subject by Dr. Kevin Skinner, one of the founders of Adult Recovery Center in Linden, Utah. Dr. Skinner's an expert, not only in the field of pornography addiction, but also betrayal trauma. His work shows that when we enter relationships, we're initially brought together based on physical attraction that we feel toward one, towards someone. Once we continue dating or getting to know a new love interest, um, we start dealing with our deeper levels of psychological intimacy, which are honesty, trust, loyalty, and commitment. I view it almost as an intimacy ladder. At the bottom rung is verbal intimacy. This means that in a perfect world, we would first get to know our partner in a way which we feel like we can talk about anything with them. We can't wait to talk to them the next day and the next. Our conversations can go on for hours. We want to know everything we can about our partner and the feeling is mutual. It's reciprocal. They too want to know everything they can about you. Once you feel like that verbal intimacy is in place, you move up the ladder to emotional intimacy, meaning you can share your emotions with your partner and know that they will treat them with respect. And while I'm speaking on the subject, I often say that your emotions with someone is like handing them your heart. What are they going to do with it? Are they going to be careful with it, delicate with it? Are they going to throw it on the ground, stomp on it, and leave it in the street? If the former, and they're going to treat it with respect, then now we have verbal and emotional intimacy with that partner. And we not only want to talk with them, we want to share everything with them. Next up on the ladder is cognitive and intellectual intimacy. These all play into the feelings that you're on the same page with your partner. Even if one of you is a brain surgeon, the other is a janitor, you still feel connected because you have the verbal and emotional intimacy as a base. Up from there comes spiritual intimacy, which again, if you're connected verbally, emotionally, cognitive, and intellectually, then you can be in different places spiritually, but you still feel connected. So what is the top rung of the ladder, you might be asking? Physical intimacy. In my opinion, and in Dr. Skinner's work, when you're connected on all these lower rungs or lower levels, then physical intimacy becomes a byproduct of being so connected. This is an entirely new, wonderful view of physical intimacy or version of physical intimacy. Here we go. Too often, men with pornography addictions believe strongly that their relationship begins with the foundation of physical intimacy. And once physical intimacy is established, then they're willing to explore verbal, emotional, cognitive, and intellectual intimacy. I maintain that the entire paradigm needs to be shifted, and there can be a lot of pushback, especially from men who have struggled with pornography and compulsive sexual behavior. They don't want to give up the, quote, if we just had more sex, everything would be better story that their brains are telling them. Because the truth is, more sex will not fix their marriage. It will only continue to be a go-to whenever they are feeling bored, lonely, angry, scared, tired, you name it. They need to change their relationship with intimacy. I feel like it's important to note that when I work with couples, we talk about the fact that physical intimacy is absolutely a part of a healthy relationship, but increased sexual activity doesn't fix emotional scars. I'll make a bold statement. I believe that in most every marriage, a couple's entire intimacy paradigm needs to be shifted. I've had dozens and dozens of couples come in for things entirely unrelated to their intimate lives. But once we start talking, the subject of physical intimacy eventually comes up. Even in situations where people initially state that they're happy with their sex lives, upon further discovery, the relationship typically settles into a pursuer and a withdrawer. Or in many cases, the wife has over time learned that a way to keep the peace is to give her husband sex on a regular basis, whether or not her emotional needs are being addressed. A healthier relationship with intimacy discussed earlier on in a marriage would go a long way toward improving a couple's secure connection in general. Sorry, that was probably the longest one I did. I didn't realize that. Josh, <laughs> the former uh, pornography addict. I like your take on this. Okay, well, again, the question is, finding out he's addicted to porn has turned me off to sex completely. What should I do? 
And my advice as the former pornography addict is first, relax. I couldn't imagine a situation where this didn't have a negative effect on your sexual life. If you're like most serious couples, intercourse comes with a level of intimacy that you would never show others. And I'm not talking about making the kind of home videos that celebrities love to leak. When you're truly in love with somebody, having sex transcends into that ultra cheesy label of lovemaking. Despite the fact the term is corny, the feelings are true. Now you have a partner who you have shared the most intimate personal experiences with who has cheapened it in your eyes with his porn addiction. How could you not feel a sense of betrayal? If he, even if he wasn't an actual sex addict, he was engaging with materials that depicted what you found so intimate and special. It's as if he's telling you what you felt was not what he felt. After I found out, I think that it was actually me that had a gut punch to the libido. My wife was able to recognize that while the pornography was certainly a surrogate for sexual interaction, there were a lot of other things going on in my head. I've met men and women who get hypersexual after something like this happens. I've met women who think that they need to reenact scenes from pornography in the bedroom to get the man interested. And I know of many who didn't want to touch their partner with the proverbial 10 foot pole. I think this is an opportunity for discussion. If he's a typical addict, he probably hasn't full, been fully communicative with his needs or desires. I was honest with my wife that I had always been scared to death to ever request anything exotic or tell her what I liked versus what I didn't like. I just couldn't talk about intercourse with the one person who I should be able to talk about anything. That's on me, not her. You need to work on your relationship and attempt to heal the betrayal that has occurred. Odds are you didn't fall in love with the guy because you didn't fall in love with the guy because you thought he didn't watch pornography. I don't think being porn free is a quality most women look for in the beginning of a relationship, although you may re be regretting that now. So why did you fall in love with him? Have those characteristics changed over time? If the answer is yes, was it because of the pornography? If they haven't changed, can you try focusing on them for a while? You may be running through the idea in your head, what else has he lied about? It may be hard to feel intimate with someone who you're expecting to spring more surprises on you. That's understandable. If you can't feel those feelings returning, speak to a professional, either with or without him. A sex-free relationship is not healthy. In rehab, I met a few women who were known as sexual anorexics with their anti-sex behavior. They were just as unhealthy as the full-on sex addicts. Your sex life is a spectrum, and you want to be somewhere in the middle where the healthy reside. Okay. So, and I, I just, I really feel like that, uh, that gives a good idea of where we go in the book. I mean, we really do try to be very respectful. Um, and I think we do try to address people's individual experiences, but also speak from the experience, uh, what you have gone through. And I like, you can speak to that directly. And then every one of these questions brought up a dozen or more, uh, if not a hundred or more, um, sessions in my office. Right. And, and you and I are just starting to get reviews on this, and yeah. Ashley Peterson wrote a great one, which was important to me is that she says that we are not uh, necessarily pro-staying together, we're right. not pro-breaking up. Yeah. We are not telling the person what to do. The yeah. overall theme is take a breath and assess the situation. Yeah, because that's not what happens. And, and I, I appreciated that because I think that's in, in both of our unique ways that's the theme that comes across is yeah. don't make rash decisions, but we're also not going to tell you what to do because this is your individual journey. There you go. Right. Okay. Let's, let's go into, there's a whole chapter on, uh, on spiritual um, questions. And, and I, I was really grateful for that because I do work with a pretty uh, heavily spiritual population. And, and these are some of the ones that I feel like um, being honest, they kind of break my heart the most. And uh, so if we go to page 98, and I really, I, again, these, I, mine isn't very long, um, so I won't go on again. Like What's I did that? My, my, that? my answer isn't as long. Oh, your answer, your answer, okay. <laughs> so it says, does this mean that God is mad at me or doesn't love me? So Tony, the mental health professional, absolutely not. I believe this is, I believe this beyond a shadow of a doubt. His heart breaks for you. He weeps for you. You're a child of God. And as a parent, don't you want the best for your child? I believe after working with over a thousand pornography addicts, this is one of the biggest lies they're telling themselves that God has given up on them, that he doesn't love them or that he is mad at them. I'm a huge believer. And here I go with, I told you, I tried to work this into almost everything. I'm a huge <laughs> believer in the evidence-based counseling modality called acceptance and commitment therapy, also known as ACT. 
simplified, you can set a goal to put pornography behind you once and for all, and that feels good. Your brain squirts a bit of dopamine, a feel-good chemical to the reward center of your brain, and for a short time, you feel like this is going to be different. Uh, you're going to exercise, you're going to eat right, you're going to read your scriptures, you're going to pray morning and night. Shortly after that initial rush, ACT teaches that you can then sit back. Um, I believe that Christ-like love is unconditional. Love, uh, you know that God will never give up on you. He's always there for you. I think asking yourself this question either comes from shame you're feeling or it's being put upon you by others. This is wrong because it can lead to more shame and more isolation. It's understandable that you're asking this question because you're in a pattern of negative thinking right now. Is he angry with you? Does he want to punish you? It's actually quite the opposite. Okay, Josh. Well, and, uh, I, I feel like I feel like I kind of left a little bit hanging there too, though. Um, but I mean that 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 acceptance and commitment therapy model, where I was saying, is that you know there it, it does feel like okay, I can do this, and then those negative stories typically come uh, rushing back into our into our brains. Yeah, uh, no, I and 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 that was one of the answers I really liked because, and I say this in a previous answer, I'm not as uh, devoutly religious as you are. I mm -hmm. think there, there's definitely a level of spirituality with me that I have cultivated in recovery. But as far as, you know, f being a religious person, you know, you have that over on me. So I just want to let that be known uh, before I answer my question. Uh, does this mean that God is mad at me or doesn't love me? And as the former pornography addict, my answer was, much like you have to understand that your partner's addiction doesn't have anything to do with you, you need to understand that God isn't mad at you and hasn't stopped loving you for a condition another person is struggling with. Do you think God gets mad at the wife of someone with leukemia or cancer? I can't believe that's the case. Even if the person with the health condition did things like smoking to bring upon their fate. My God isn't mad at the smoker, much less his girlfriend or wife. I understand that the practice of looking at pornography is a sin for most believers, but if you want to nitpick, there is sin throughout all of our lives. I have a hard time believing he is going to pick this one and blame you. That's not the higher power I worship. I think you need to look at this as a test or a series of tests. The first is whether you stay or go. Maybe God is testing you to see if you'll stay or go. Maybe he's testing your patience. Maybe he's not testing anything that has to do with you. And just like the addiction itself, this is all about your partner. I don't know exactly what God you pray to, but mine doesn't get mad at me and could never not love me. And I, and I appreciate you, you know, you're framing that as uh, the, maybe I, I, I a bit more, uh, spirituality is maybe a bit more, but I mean, your answer there is, uh, is beautiful. I mean, that part at the end is what I liked in particular of, uh, you know, my, my God doesn't get mad at me and uh, could never not love me. I mean, I feel like that's, that, that's uh, a, a message of hope, which um, I really appreciate. Um, let's hit one more. Do you have time sure. for one more? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, talking to the kids. I think this is a big one as well. And, um, and, and I liked your answer here a lot as well. I, uh, okay, mine's a tiny bit long. I will, uh, I will make it quick. How much do we tell the kids? Uh, Tony, the mental health professional. And, and now I know I like that we had already framed of the, the challenges I had writing because now I'm starting to say, hey, I think I must answer every question beginning in some way like this. There's no simple, <laughs> an There's no simple answer to this question. Um, there are as many experts that believe you should tell your children under the veil of complete family transparency as there are who believe that the children should absolutely not know about a partner's extramarital affair or pornography use. In my practice, I've seen both sides and I've seen them both go well and I've seen them both unfortunately not. So that, that was clear as mud, right? Yeah, very oh. good. Take, okay. taking, a, taking a strong stand. <laughs> My first impression without knowing more about the details of your situation is no, you don't tell the kids, let the dust settle. If your child is one of who caught their dad on the computer watching graphic pornography, then yes, you need to be able to explain what happened and what they saw, and that needs to happen without shaming the child. However, as with the majority of answers given in this book, there is no exact science to the answer because every child processes information through their own lens, just as we do. One 10-year-old might be able to better understand the situation uh, more than another 15-year-old. While there are definitely age-appropriate guidelines, you know your kids better than anyone else. So ultimately, this information use this information as a guide and then adjust for the needs and makeup of each child. Developmental biologist Jean Piaget is known for developing a blueprint that breaks down the stages of, quote, normal intellectual development from infant through adulthood. This includes thought, judgment, and knowledge. These stages are sensory motor from birth through approximately two years, pre-operational from toddlerhood or two years through early childhood, roughly age seven, concrete operational or roughly ages seven through 12, and then former operational from adolescence through adulthood. Working from Piaget's model, I find that when it comes to younger children up through early adolescence, 
unless they were exposed to images or videos or if they were brought around the affair partner and they feel uncomfortable, you don't need to tell the kids. I process situations like why was daddy in bed with that lady from the school in situations where they have been exposed, I recommend seeking professional help for the children to learn how best to communicate. The key is that you don't want to ignore questions by your child. I think that's one of the big keys. As the child gets older, mid to late adolescence to teens, they typically can pick up on problems between parents. I've talked with kids who have told me something's going on and either they think I'm an idiot for not noticing or they're idiots because they can't see it's happening. You don't have to get into great detail, but you can say something like, your father's going through some rough times, I'm trying to support him, but it's, it's a rough time for both of us. If they press for details, you can let them know it's a private matter and again, seek help from a professional to help them process as well. For adult children, especially if they're not living at home, it's a matter of what you want to tell them. I leave that up as a group decision between your partner and yourself. Here's the part that I really wanted to get to. Uh, the most important thing is that this information not be used as a weapon against your spouse. You need to keep in mind that you're ultimately trying to work with what, toward what is best for the kids. Knowing how the, knowing how the kids are going to respond is important. And I've seen situations where a mother knew the kids would immediately vilify the father as she used that as a uh, threat against them. So keep the question, why am I sharing any details with my children at the top of your mind and let that answer guide you. Um, and, and I just quickly, before we get to your answer, I feel like one of the biggest things I see is, is couples will say, hey, we just want what's best for the kids. And I feel like every couple says that initially, but then I, I feel like when people then step away, sometimes when that anger consumes them, then they're, you know, they, 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 they still may not even recognize that they are weaponizing the kids. Right. Well, yeah. and I think we want, what, we want what's best for the kids is one of those situations of I know what I'm supposed to say. Yeah, I think you're right. Absolutely. Okay. I know, gonna... I know, I know how I would like to believe yep. and I know what I'm supposed to say, but the reality is very different. Well, and let me really quickly, uh, the example I see often is in, so then if, uh, if, you know, and I've got, I've had this one so many times, then kid asks dad, you know, uh, why is, uh, why are you sleeping in another room? You know, instead of, he's like, well, go ask your mom. I mean, it was, she's the one that, that wanted me to. And then it's like, okay, is that the best for the kids? And then the guy will look at me and say, Hey, I, I mean, I just, I don't want to, I've got to be honest. And it's like, no, no, you just wanted to vilify mom, you right. know? And yeah. pass the buck. Yeah, exactly. Okay. All right, your answer. So uh, my answer to how much do we tell the kids, uh, and keep in mind, this comes from my point of view of, I was outed by the police showing up at my door. There was no yeah. plan the morning I woke up this happening. So it all <laughs> just hit me. Um, so from uh, the former pornography addict, we had no choice because of the public way I was outed as a pornography addict since the media reported on it almost immediately. The kids were going to find out sooner than later if we didn't address the situation as it happened. I simply left it at, daddy looked at pictures she shouldn't have looked at. That seemed to be enough of an explanation for my son. And my no I know my daughter and wife had a deeper conversation about why people look at pornography in which I did not participate. My daughter was 13 at the time and my son was 10. They didn't seem to care too much about the addiction, but it was more about how it would change our lives. Since I lost my job, they were worried about how we'd pay our bills. There was some talk about leaving our town, which hit them both hard. Not surprisingly, like kids do, they made it about how it would affect them, and we made sure to parent them with that in mind. How open are you with your kids about the other issues in your life? If you try to hide money trouble or drama in the family from them, you're probably better off to handle it that way, especially in an age-appropriate context. If your children are older and will probably figure things out sooner or later, you may want to have a conversation with your partner about how to address it. You have one chance to control the situation in relation to your children, and that's at the very beginning. My first book came out when my daughter was 18 and my son was 15. It got into the reasons I developed and nurtured the addiction. My daughter didn't want to read it, and my son read the entire thing the day it was released. He said it made him sad in places, but he could handle it. It's out there if she ever wants to uh, read it, but I'm never going to force her. If you have older children or adult children away from home, I think that it comes down to whether you are staying or not. If you're staying, think long and hard before sharing the information about dad's addiction early in his recovery. If you're leaving, you can gloss over it in the short term and evaluate down the road if it's your place or his to say anything. Okay. I, uh, I just love that part about with your first book and the different experiences with your son and daughter. I mean, I feel like that, I really think that speaks to the again, everyone can it handles this in their own way. And so, right. Uh, and, and, our job is not to force the issue. 
Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And my daughter and I have a wonderful relationship and my son and I have a wonderful relationship. They're very different relationships mm -hmm. and I have to be a different father who uh, nurtures them um, and parents them in different ways because they're individual people who are just as different as much as they are alike. Yeah. I love it. Hey, uh, quickly too. Um, uh, I have, again, I mean, first time uh, co-author, I've been pretty blown away by the professional reviews that we received. And, uh, and I just, I'm, I'm kind of putting that out there for a lot of therapists listen to my podcast. A lot of uh, people that struggle with addictions listen. A lot of people that have experienced betrayal trauma listen. And, and I'm not just trying to say this because it's our book project, but I'm just, I'm really grateful that you had this idea, this vision. And, and I just, I, I, the reviews we're getting, um, I was nervous. I mean, I was worried that the, we wouldn't get a good review. I was worried that people would think, uh, Oh, these guys are full of themselves to try to tell people what they should do. But man, the reviews have been really, really incredible from the people that, that know this field and industry. And, and I think it goes back to what you said at the beginning, there had not been a book like this. And, and so I really appreciate the opportunity to do something that's conversational yet also, I think is going to help people in their recovery, um, both from the betrayed and the addicted. Well, and I hope that, you know, you, you point out that, uh, you know, we got a lot of great reviews from the uh, therapist and the uh, CSAT community mm -hmm. um, because because there's nothing out, out there like this. And for a lot of the therapists who, who might be listening or whatever, if you don't feel like you have the working knowledge when somebody comes in and talks about pornography or e even sex addiction, because that can easily be transferred into this book. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, this could be a good primer for you. This could be the kind of thing that you uh, you know, give to your patients. One of the exactly. great, great things about rehab when I was there, and one of the great things about my therapist who knows that I like to read, is that these people are always handing me books that they've enjoyed or that they got more out of because we have an hour together. So yeah. we can't do this. You can sit there and read them our book, or you can hand them our book and, and let them read it and bring it back the next week, uh, or you can sell it to them. That's even better. <laughs> um, but, but the thing is, I think that uh, hopefully this makes a dent into the community that, that you're a big part of because I think it can be such a great resource, not just for the patients, but also for the clinicians and the therapists themselves. And I, and I do. And I thought about that earlier in, when you were talking about um, when the, the betrayed were reaching out to you and you didn't want to say the wrong thing. Unfortunately, this is such a, uh, you have to spend time in this, in this world either. I mean, you've been there as the addict. I mean, I've got almost 15 years now of working with the, the betrayed and the addicted. And, and if I'm being honest, I mean, I, I hear a lot of stories that, again, break my heart of maybe the betrayed coming into my office. And when I say, hey, what's your experience with counseling in the past? You know, they'll, they'll share a story with me where uh, the first question out of a non-trained counselor is, well, you know, were you, were you having enough sex? Like, is that part right. of what you did? And man, I mean, first of all, I want to like go give me the therapist number. I want to go strangle them, you know, which, yeah. uh, um, and that is not a threat to others. I do not need to be reported for that. Uh, but, but you know, those are those things that it's like, yeah, if you're a therapist and you're hearing this and you really don't have the training necessary. Um, and I think one of the, if I'm being super honest, I think therapists listen, will know this. If you, if your practice is new, if your practice is struggling, you know, a lot of times therapists do say, I, I'm sure I can handle this. You know, yeah. I, I'm sure I can build rapport and then I can use some, some good uh, therapeutic modality and I can help somebody through this. But if you really don't know what you're talking about, you, you, there is a potential to do some some damage and i think again that goes back to why the book was a struggle for me to write at times was i just was worried about that but i feel like i feel like what we've put together here is just a really good resource well, and just, just to quickly add, um, I, I kind of feel that same way when I go and I look at Reddit forums or yeah. NoFap forums yeah. and see, you know, it's great that there's fellowship. It's great that there's guys helping each other. But having been through so much therapy, having done so much research, um, knowing a lot of people like yourself now who mm -hmm. are experts in this area, um, I feel like I know a lot more than a lot of these guys who are helping each other yeah. online who have never been to therapy, who, who don't know any of the science behind this, who don't understand understand betrayal trauma or trauma in and of itself, uh, trying to give each other advice. Yeah. And, you know, that, that's one of those areas where it's like, if you want to be an armchair psychologist on Reddit, you know, 
do some reading, get, get a little bit of experience. I, I'm never going to go to all, all the schooling to get to the point that you did. I don't have it in me, but I like to help people online. I like to help people when they write me an email. And uh, I think that this book can help a lot of those people as well. Yeah. All right. Joshua Shea, I, I, I want to, uh, we should talk again about, uh, re- maybe we'll do a part two and read a few more of the answers or that sort of thing. I think that'd be, uh, that'd be kind of fun. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Okay. I, 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 I get the feeling that your answers are for college graduates and my answers are for high school graduates. But, uh, there's the yin and the yang. There's yeah. the, the ebb and the flow the, it all works together. Um, and, uh, and we'll allow people to live happily ever after. Absolutely. Oh, real quick. Where can people find you? Oh yeah. That's, that's a good, that's a good point. Um, uh, I have a website I update daily. Uh, all my podcast appearances are there. It's recoveringpornaddict.com. If you need resources for your porn addiction, if you want to read about my recovery journey, it's all there. Recoveringpornaddict.com. Perfect. Joshua Shea, uh, go out there and promote the book, my friend. Okay. Um, I, (laughs) I will see you next time. Hang tight. All right. All right.